previous lectures are different from the ones that I gave previously. They are teaching kind of lectures, and I expect you to participate okay. in the lectures. And the idea, idea here is that uh, by the end of the six lectures, you ought to go away with a good understanding about how to calculate the microstructure of a steel, because you'll understand the atomic mechanisms by which all the phases form. And we decided to give these lectures because John said, can you give a lecture about classification of steel microstructures, which I thought was a really boring technique because, you know, to classify things you can use completely subjective arguments and you'll find numerous classification schemes which are not very meaningful except to communicate with each other. So here is a scheme which ought to allow you to actually calculate the development of phases in the steel. And today I'm going to completely cover Martin's electric transformations, and the lecture this morning uh, will be about the presentation of the characteristics, and I hope to leave you in a state of confusion, because you'll see there are actually huge contradictions as far as Martin's side is concerned, and in the afternoon we will solve those uh, contradictions using theory which was first developed in Australia by Bowles and Mackenzie. Okay. Absolutely spectacular theory, 1953. And the paper was actually rejected. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Okay. So, so we'll start off by... Yeah, so all papers which are rejected are really the seminal papers. <laughs> so, first of all, okay, uh, what do you understand by margin site? Can you just brainstorm and tell me what the characteristics of margin site are? Rapid transformation. Rapid transformation? Diffusion okay. risk. Okay. Okay. Air thermal. Hybrid plates. Yeah, so there is a, a crystallography. Yeah. Let's make it more general. Yeah. yeah. Crystallography. So it's a reproducible crystallography. Okay. Another characteristic like hard brittle. Hard brittle, yeah. There's still things missing which you ought to know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've got rapid, Martin side is thought to be rapid, it's diffusionless, a-thermal, there's lots of crystallography there, reproducible crystallography. Depending on composition? Sorry? Composition dependence. Yeah. Expression composition dependence. Yeah. Uh, so it's very sensitive to composition. And what materials do we get Martin side in? All fine, including ceramic. Yeah, so many different kinds of materials. Okay. So what, what I'm going to do is, that this is a brainstorming session. And in brainstorming session, you know, things can be right or wrong, but they actually stimulate a lot of thought. So some of these characteristics are correct as listed over here, uh, but some of them will demonstrate are not correct. Okay. Um, so if I go on to my next slide, you know, you explain that you can get modern side in many different materials. And that's absolutely right. So, for example, uh, it's not restricted to steels. Although steels, the martensite is the most important, the most important technological application of martensite is in steels, really. It, it just wipes out any other application of martensite. But nevertheless, in ceramics, by inducing martensitic transformation, you can triple the toughness. Now, that's not saying a lot because ceramics are brittle anyway. So, but nevertheless, you know, an improvement from almost zero toughness to something like three or four megapascal root meters is a significant achievement. So, uh, zirconia, for example, um, one of the things that we haven't listed here is that martensite begins at a certain temperature, which we call the martensite start temperature. So, MS, or martensite start temperature. And we need to understand what controls that start temperature because it's not an equilibrium temperature. You don't find it on a phase diagram, etc. Uh, and here is a list of the martensite start temperature. And this is the hardness of the martensite that you get in, in Vickers numbers. This is an iron, 31 nickel, 0.23 carbon. The martensite start temperature is 83 Kelvin. And I can even get martensite at 4 Kelvin. So one of the characteristics that we've missed 
is that it is possible to get martensite at very low temperatures. Okay? And that's consistent with the transformation being diffusionless. You know, you couldn't possibly get it at 4 Kelvin if it required diffusion. But that doesn't mean that it always happens at low temperatures, because look, here we have a martensitic transformation happening at 1200 degrees centigrade. So the condition is that martensite can form at a very low temperature, but it need not form at a low temperature. And that indicates to us that it may be diffusionless. Here is an argon nitrogen solid solution, which undergoes martensitic transformation at about 30 Kelvin. You can get martensitic transformations in crystalline polymers. You even get martensite in life and in death. So let me show you an example of that. So this is a, a schematic of a, a virus. And the virus has, a, if you like, a head. And there's this arrangement here, which is a hypodermic needle and a couple of arms here. And the virus then latches onto a bacterium and operates this hypodermic needle and injects the bacterium with its DNA. So in effect, it commits suicide here because, you know, without DNA, what is life? Yeah? But of course, the DNA then reproduces inside the bacterium and you get lots more viruses. The viruses actually have a very hard life because they're never actually mate. You know, the way that they reproduce is by infecting the bacterium. So there's no fun at all in their life. Now, the way in which this operates, this hypodermic needle, is that it consists of a cylindrical crystal like this, okay, which undergoes a martensitic transformation. We don't know what triggers that transformation, but it's going to have something to do with contact with the bacterium. And uh, here is an actual optical micrograph showing a virus infecting a bacterium and operating this crystal to inject the bacterium, to pierce the bacterium and pass on its DNA. Okay. So martensite can happen in many, many materials. We now know that. Uh, and it has different applications in different scenarios. What is the evidence that the transformation is diffusionless? Well, first of all, we've said that it can grow at very low temperatures, 4 Kelvin. Okay. It doesn't necessarily have to grow at very low temperatures but it can grow at very low temperatures where diffusion is impossible. Um, again, you know, it isn't true to say that martensite forms very rapidly in all circumstances. You, you can apply a stress and you'll see the martensite growing gently. But it can grow at the speed of sound inside your material, which is more than a thousand meters per second. And the largest rate at which a diffusional transformation, a transformation which requires the movement of atoms, has ever been reported is about 80 meters per second. And that is through very, very rapid cooling of liquid. Okay? The solidification rate of nickel, approximately 80 meters per second. This thing can happen at more than 1,000 meters per second in iron. Okay? And it can happen so rapidly that you even emit sounds so if you go to my website and you search for uh, singing, you can hear the song of Martin Syed, Okay, It's quite beautiful. It sounds like a, a chorus of bells. Okay. So Martin Syed can grow very rapidly, but it need not grow very rapidly. And of course, you can measure the chemical composition of Martin Syed, and you can show that it's exactly the same as that of the parent phase. Now, that is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient, as you'll find in some subsequent lectures. We can get a transformation without composition change, even though there is the diffusion of atoms. So all this indicates to us that it's a diffusionless transformation, and there is really no controversy about this. This is what uh, Martin's eye typically looks like, an optical micrograph, and we have these plates of martensite inside the parent phase. So the characteristic shape always, without any exception, is that of a plate. Okay. Now, why, why does this martensite form as a plate? Well, we'll answer that shortly. Secondly, you can identify very clear crystallography. So 
this plate is forming on a particular crystallographic plane, let's say one on one, and this will be another variant <coughs> of the one on one plane, and this will be yet another variant of the one on one plane. So every single plate will have the same crystallography, and that makes a lot of sense because you are generating the crystal structure by a coordinated movement of atoms. Now the reason why we get this thin plate shape uh, is that you will see that there is a lot of strain when mitocide forms and to minimize that strain energy in a bulk material, so here we are surrounded by many other crystals of the parent phase, it adopts the shape of a plate. Of course, if we didn't have this constraint, if this was a single crystal transforming in air, then you would get a flat interface which is equal to this <coughs> habit plane. Habit plane is simply the interface between the parent and product. But the shape need not be that of a thin plate. Um, that habit plane, so the first confusing fact about Martin okay, is that I talked about the Martin side forming on a one 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 plane. But actually it never does that. It forms on really complicated planes. So, notice that I've got approximate habit plane indices. The actual habit plane is irrational. In other words, you can't express it in terms of integers. It's not 1, 1, 1, it's very close to 1, 1, 1, but if you measured it extremely accurately, you still couldn't express the habit plane in terms of integers. If I just slightly change the composition, I get a weird plane, 295, close to 295, or 315, 10, 252, 111, uh, close to 111. They're never exactly those indices. Now, why should you know, nature choose to form martensite on a plane that is close to 310, 15? Yeah? Why not form on a nice, neat, close back plane? Yeah. So, the most accurate measurements and you will find there are no rational planes on which Martin side forms. So this is a very important result that the habit plane is irrational. Habit plane is irrational. So this is an experimental result. Why don't things happen on simple crystallographic planes like close back planes and close back directions? So any theory must be able to predict this plane exactly. Simple dislocation theory sim just won't do because dislocations move on nice neat planes. Yeah. Mm. Similarly, if you look at the orientation relationship between the parent and the product phase, you'll find uh, you know, very simple statements of orientation relationship in the literature. For example, the kojimov sachs orientation where the closed back uh, planes and closed aspect directions of the two phases are exactly parallel. Okay, and another variant of it, but more or less the same, that the closed back planes of the two crystals and the closed aspect directions are parallel. But these are approximations. Okay, they are very misleading. The real orientation relationship is again irrational. So you won't have the 111 plane of austenite being exactly parallel to the 011 plane of ferrite, they'll be at an angle, okay? a small angle which has a strange value. And similarly, the close back directions in those planes will not be parallel, there will be some angle. So even the orientation relationship is strange. We have an irrational orientation relationship. Uh, and approximately, the close back planes of the parent lattice, I call the parent lattice gamma for austenite, uh, is approximately parallel to the most closely packed plane of the martensite, which is alpha. And if I look within this plane, there is close back directions of this form, and they are approximately parallel to the close back directions of the modern side, but they are only approximately parallel. You know, there might be something like half a degree 
between the close back planes. So why why does that happen? That still doesn't make sense. So that's the second bit of confusing information. Okay. So the actual orientation relationships are irrational. And this has been known for you know many, many decades before the theory was actually formulated because X-ray experiments could be done to accurately measure the crystallography of martensite well before it could be explained. Uh, you mentioned that it was an athermal transformation. Now the meaning of athermal is that when you induce martensite okay, by cooling at a rate which avoids all the other transformations, um, so, it, when we say martensite is generated by rapid cooling, again, that's not uh, always the case. If you have an alloy in which these transformations are suppressed, then you can cool very gently and obtain martensite. The point is, you have to cool at a rate which avoids all other transformations. As I cool and I reach the martensite start temperature, I will get a certain fraction of transformation. In order to get more transformation, I need to cool further. It doesn't matter if I hold at this temperature for a long time, I will not get more than 1% transformation. Similarly, if I hold at this temperature for a long time, I will not get more than 50% transformation, and so on. So there's something which makes the transformation air thermal. You know, in this equation, which describes the evolution of the volume fraction of martensite as a function of the martensite start temperature and the temperature below MS, there is no time in there. Okay. So, I will, we will have to explain this effect as well. Okay. So, that is the meaning of air thermal transformation. It is, in fact, possible to get isothermal martensitic transformation under certain conditions, but we'll talk about that uh, in the second lecture. So, at the moment, we are just summarizing all the characteristics of martensite. Now, Imagine that you have the interface between martensite and austenite, and it's got to move at a thousand <coughs> meters per second. Okay, really, really fast motion. Then, basically, you cannot have any process which is not conservative. In other words, which involves the creation of vacancies or interstitials, yeah? or, or the climb of dislocations. You cannot have any structure in the boundary which will slow it down. So, we say that by stating that the interface between the parent uh, product and parent phases has to be glissile. That means it has to be able to move without thermal activation. And interfaces can be described in terms of dislocations, because look, if I, if I take uh, a single crystal, Okay, so this is now a single crystal, and I want to create a bicrystal. Okay. Then I can cut a slit over here and tilt the two sides with respect to each other. Okay. So I cut a slit, so that's now a bicrystal. Yeah. And that's like putting a wedge of material to tilt the two halves apart, right? And the dislocation, if you look at its atomic structure, consists of an extra half plane. So these are planes of uh, atoms, and we've got this plane ending here. That's like shoving a wedge into the material. So an interface is properly described in terms of an array of dislocations. And if the dislocations have their burgers vectors pointing out of this plane, then they are glissile. They can move without climb. But if they are like this, then that interface cannot move without diffusion, because we've got to get rid of the atoms at the end of this plane to allow the dislocation to translate. Yeah. Yeah. So ask me questions if you don't follow. Okay. So this is what we call a sessile interface. And for a diffusion of transformation, it really doesn't matter what kind of interface it is, because there's plenty of thermal activation to allow dislocations to climb, etc. But for a martensitic transformation, it is a necessary condition that the interface must be glissile. 
and that puts severe restrictions on what materials can have Martin Cetic transformation. Because what we need is a line going through the interface, which is completely coherent between the parent and the product phases. Okay. It has to be completely coherent. Because if that is not the case, if that line going through the board is not an invariant line, that means completely unrotated and undistorted, then I will need another set of dislocations to accommodate the misfit along that direction. Okay? Now, the problem with having two arrays of dislocations in the interface is that they will interfere with each other. So imagine that I've got two dislocations here. <coughs> Berg's vector B1 and B2. And they cut each other. Then, when this dislocation cuts this dislocation, it will introduce a step which points along B1. Okay, so here we are. We have a step there. Okay. And similarly, this <coughs> dislocation will acquire a step parallel to B2. So we see we've created a step. Okay. So notice this is a, a screw dislocation, okay? Because the Burgers vector is parallel to the line vector. This segment is no longer a screw dislocation. Yeah, because now the Burgers vector is inclined to the line vector. Right? Now, supposing this was gliding in this plane here. You can no longer do that because we've introduced what's known as a jog, a step on the dislocation. So we've rendered a dislocation which was glissal, we've made it sassal. So we're not allowed to have more than one set of dislocations inside our interface because they will interfere with each other and stop that interface from being this up. Okay. So a very important result is that in order to have Martin Cedric transformation in any material, you must be able to find one line which is completely coherent between the parent and the product phases. Okay. We call that line an invariant line. So a necessary condition for any material to undergo Martin Cedric transformation You know, you might have wondered why some materials undergo Martin Cedric transformations and others do not yeah. Necessary condition for any material form Martin side is that there must exist exist an invariant line line between parent and product phases. And an invariant line means that it's completely undistorted, it's not extended, and it's not rotated by the transformation. So, this means it's undistorted and unrotated. I can express this in another way that the deformation which changes the parent into the product must at the very least be an invariant line strain. It must leave one line undistorted and unrotated. So the distortion, the deformation which makes gamma go to alpha must be an invariant line strain as a minimum. So the deformation of gamma alpha must be at least an invariant line strain. Okay. It could be more general than that. It could be an invariant plane strain which leaves the whole plane undistorted and unrotated. But at, as a minimum condition for Martin Cetic transformation in any material, you must be able to find one line between the parent and product phases 
which remains completely coherent. Otherwise, you need more than one set of dislocations in the interface, and that renders the interface sessile. Because look, if I have to accommodate misfit along another direction, then I will need another set of dislocations. Everybody happy with that? So, you know, you already have a very powerful result. Yeah? Supposing tomorrow you say, okay, I've got a nickel gallium alloy, yeah? and I want to see whether I can get margin size in that. Then, if you can find a completely coherent line between the two phases, then in principle it's possible to get margin size. But if you cannot find such a line, say when you transform the nickel gallium, you get an isotropic expansion then there will be no line which is left coherent because all lines will be extended. And then it's impossible, even in principle, to get mountain city transformation. So it's a very powerful result. Okay. So is there kind of a chance that it could happen? I mean, yeah. Uh, you, you mean even if there is no invariant line? No. Because we are assuming what the product faces mm. and then seeing if there is an invariant line. Yes. But to start, if you start from first, from first and you don't know what the product thing is, that's kind of yeah. sort of uncertain. Sure. So, you know, if you have, if you try different crystal structures and you know their lattice okay. parameters, etc., mm -hmm. then you could, you could work it out, whether there's an invariant line or not. Okay, okay so just to summarize, uh, a glissal interface cannot contain more than one set of dislocations. And Martin Zedek transformation is only possible if the deformation which changes the parent into the product phase leaves a single line undistorted and unrotated, and we call that an invariant line. And the deformation that carries the parent phase into the product phase, as a minimum condition, has to be an invariant line strain. Right. We haven't actually solved anything about these inconsistencies as yet, as to why the habit plane is irrational, why the orientation relationship is irrational. So, if you look at the boundary between the austenite and martensite, and this is a plan view, so we're looking uh, normal to the interface, then you will be able to pick up using transmission electron microscopy just one set of dislocations. And the reason is, as I've explained, that the condition is that the dislocation will lie along that invariant line, so there's no mismatch to accommodate along this direction, and therefore you don't need any other set of dislocations. And therefore it can be glissal. There will be no interference between the different arrays. Now, this, uh, the interface that I've illustrated is it's a very low energy interface. It has only one set of dislocations and there's full coherency along that line. And therefore we expect interfacial energy to be quite low. And just to give you an idea, uh, this is the interfacial energy typically of martensite in steels, about 0 0.2 joules per meter squared. And to compare, a twin boundary is also a very coherent boundary. So it's very comparable to twin boundaries. Uh, a normal grain boundary would be of the order of uh, 0.8 joules per meter square. And if you look at the surface energy of silica glass, it's of the order of 1 joule per meter square. So we have a lot of coherency in the interface between martensite and austenite. Now, if you take a sample of austenite, you polish it completely flat and you allow it to transform to martensite, then the surface will change. Okay? And this is not an etched sample. The colors are simply representing height. Okay. So it's an interference micrograph. You've got these enormous upheavals on the surface. And those upheavals come about because we are not transforming the crystal by diffusion, but by a deformation. So obviously, a deformation causes a shape change. Like any deformation, if you apply a tensile stress, yeah. you will get a change in shape. Similarly, martensitic transformation you can think of as a physical deformation which happens on certain planes in certain directions. 
and you happen to change the crystal structure at the same time. So, um, Martin City transformation truly is a deformation, and we exploit that in the design of alloys which will undergo Martin City transformation under stress and compensate for the stress. Okay? So that's the so-called trip effect, transformation-induced plasticity. But this shape deformation is extremely important. It determines so many characteristics of Martin side. So I'll show you what it looks like schematically. If you take a sample of beryllium, okay. beryllium has a Poisson's ratio which is almost zero. So if I pull, there will be no contraction in the lateral direction. So if I pull it, then you will simply get this dilatational strain, volume change, which leaves this plane undistorted and unrotated. So this is an invariant plane. Okay. Uh, you only get an expansion along <coughs> the stress axis. So this is one class of invariant plane strains. It's a uniaxial dilatation. When you shear a material, say by slip or by twinning, you get a shear strain. There's no volume change at all. Okay. And this plane is unaffected by the shear. So this is also a class of invariant plane strains. A deformation which leaves a plane unaffected. If I now combine these two, that means uniaxial, dilatation, and shear, then I get the shape change due to martensitic transmission. Because the parent and protophases don't have the same volume, okay? but the volume change is directed normal to this plane only, and there's a shear deformation this way. So we are able to find a plane which is completely undistorted and unrotated. So we are satisfying the condition that we explained earlier, that the minimum condition is that you must have an invariant line strain. You know, a line is left coherent. But if you have a whole plane left coherent, there are thousands and millions of lines in that plane. Okay. Now, what I'd like you to notice straight away is the magnitudes of these deformations. So can you give me an uh, idea of a typical elastic strain? When I, when I pull a piece of metal, oh. elastic, 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 yeah. Oh, elastic. No, no, that's too big, too big. Orders of magnitude. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you take the modulus of steel, it's about 200 gigapascals. If I apply a stress of 200 megapascals, then the elastic strain is 10 to the minus 3. Look at, look at those strains. 0 0.26, 0 0.03. That is huge. And, you know, we are surrounding the margin side with the bulk of metal. Yeah? So it's got to cause these strains inside a solid so we're going to have a huge amount of strain energy, okay? And this makes, this gives Martin side all its characteristics, okay? It is a strain energy dominated transformation, completely strain energy dominated transformation. Um, the details of the shape change are as follows. You know, if I take a crystal and I pass a dislocation through it, then you'll be left with a step. After the dislocation has gone through, you've shifted the two halves by the Burgess vector. If I have an array of dislocations on a sufficiently fine scale, then macroscopically it appears like this. So it, it, it's uh, fairly straightforward that we should expect a shape change like that. Okay. We've got an array of dislocations in the interface which are translating and causing the deformation. And the strain energy per unit volume, you do this transformation, is the shear modulus of the matrix and the square of the strains and the thickness over the length ratio. So if I plot, uh, say, for a normal material, stress versus strain, can you tell me what the elastic energy per unit volume is? Area under the curve because stress times stra strain, this area, is the stored energy in the material. Uh, so if I take half sigma epsilon, 
And now I'm going to replace uh, sigma by the stress-strain relationship. We know that sigma is equal to the elastic modulus. Um, let's call it mu times epsilon. So the strain energy per unit volume I'm substituting for sigma in here will be proportional to half mu epsilon squared. Okay? So you can see the logic in the derivation of this equation that we've got strain squared and we've got the modulus. Now it's, a, it's much more complicated because this is a plate shape. Okay? So I, I won't explain to you this because I can't in a, in a lecture like this, but it comes from the Ashilby theory for elasticity. Right? But you can see the logic of the whole equation, that there's a square of strain, an elastic modulus, and a thickness to uh, length ratio. I can explain to you why the thickness to length ratio comes into the equation. So if this is my parent phase as a cube, and I form martensite, then you can see that the magnitude of the displacement increases as I go away from the habit plane. Okay? Larger and larger. The strain is identical because it's the displacement divided by the height. But the magnitude of the displacement increases. So if I want to cause as little of a perturbation inside the bulk of my metal, then I form something that is like a thin plate. Because the net displacement is zero at the tip of that plate. Yeah. Almost zero. Okay. So that's the reason why we have the C upon R in that equation. And that is why martensite will always be in the form of a thin plate when it's constrained. Because it's to minimize the elastic strain energy. Now you could argue that, okay, this tells you that the thickness should be zero, but of course then you don't get any transformation and it wants to transform when you are below the start temperature. Okay, so just to summarize the, the difficulties that I've explained. Um, first of all, we have very strange habit planes. There's no reason why you know, the habit plane should be 3, 10, 15 and close to 3, 10, 15. It doesn't make sense. We have strange orientation relationships. The, Close back plane and close back directions are approximately parallel, but only approximately parallel. They're not exactly parallel. Now, this actually is also confusing. The shape deformation that we see is an invariant plane strain. Yeah, it leaves a plane completely coherent between the parent and product lattices. What I'm going to demonstrate to you in the next lecture is that for Martin said, it isn't possible to get a plane which is completely coherent between austenite and ferrite. Okay. And yet, when we observe macroscopically, the shape deformation is an invariant plane strain. I will sh show you in the next lecture that it is impossible to change austenite into ferrite with a deformation which leaves a plane completely coherent. So I'll finish now with this list of confusions which we will solve this afternoon, yeah? So, any questions? What's driving the transformation? Okay, that's a very good question. So, if I plot the phase diagram, temperature versus carbon concentration for iron, and it looks uh, something like this, this is gamma, and this is alpha, and this is uh, gamma plus cementite, uh, an iron carbide, and gamma plus alpha. So we'll focus on this part of the phase diagram. Uh, under equilibrium conditions, below this temperature, supposing I have an alloy of this composition, it will start to transform to alpha as soon as I hit this temperature, under equilibrium conditions. If I cool rapidly, then there's no time for that transformation to happen. So I can supercool the austenite. It wants to be in the body-centered cubic crystal structure. 
So the only mechanism by which it can happen, if there's no thermal activation, is by displacive transformation. So we have to be in a state where the free energy of the alpha is lower than that of the gamma. And that will be covered also in the second lecture. Um, you said that uh, monzite occurs in a variety of materials, possibly still. So it doesn't occur in some materials because there's no invariant plane. Yeah. Why? I yeah. mean, so let's let's look at pure nickel, for example. Okay. And uh, we can actually work out the energies of different crystal structures, even if they don't exist. Yeah. So let's say we work out the energy of body centered cubic nickel, it is never more stable than face centered cubic nickel. So the first condition is missing that we must have a reduction in free energy when the monocyte forms. But then supposing that we could form body centered cubic nickel, we still have to satisfy the condition that we need to find a coherent interface, uh, a coherent <coughs> line between the two phases. And if that is impossible, even if the free energy change allows body centered cubic nickel to exist, it won't be able to transform by a more density mechanism. So, in fact, there are two conditions that you have to satisfy. And also, about like, whether these invariant plans exist, so you said you can calculate. Yeah. Whether <coughs> lattice parameters Yeah, exactly. So you're looking at the lattice parameters <coughs> of the pair mm -hmm. of the product, and you can calculate whether they can exist in the That's right. So what, what you do is you take the two crystals, and I'll explain this in the next lecture. You take the two crystals. Of course, you can change your relative orientations in an infinite number of ways, and then you put them in contact and see whether that's a coherent interface. And that sounds very complicated. But actually, it's very, very simple. I'll show you in the next lecture how to do that. And we'll prove that it's impossible to get that <coughs> plane between austenite and ferro. Okay? Under those conditions, you can also get precipitation hardening, I think. Right. So is that what happens? If you cannot do martensite, it might do precipitation hardening. Yeah, so I mean... The idea is to reduce the pain that's right. If the austenite is not stable, mm -hmm it will want to decompose. It's all a question of how long it will take. You know, I mean, and when you go down, as you go lower and lower, the diffusional transformations which require atoms to move uh, will become very, very, very slow. So, you know, the information we have on the iron-nickel phase diagram, yeah, at 400 degrees centigrade, you can't possibly do an experiment. It will take, you know, yeah. centuries. But we have meteorites, yeah. Yeah, and from that, yeah. you know, they cool at... Uh, one degree per million years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, normally, it is like volume expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't uh, it try to stay in a lower uh, energy state? It, like expansion should have uh, energy, uh, like strain energy. Higher, yeah, strain energy on a higher energy level. Right. But while it's cooling, it should go in lower energy state. No, I I, I think uh, you know it's a good question. Yeah. But supposing I take the modern site and I heat it extremely rapidly, yeah, very, very rapidly using a laser or something like that, then it will reverse modern static transformation to austenite, okay, even though there's a reduction in volume. So in addition to the volume term, there are other terms as well, which can overwhelm the volume change strain energy. So it, you know, in general, uh, whether we have a positive or negative volume change is not sufficient to say whether it should form or not. We can get a reduction in volume if we reverse the multi transformation by a displacing mechanism. Up to you. Yeah. After you lower the temperature, how long do you have to wait for the transformation to happen? It's almost, in, almost instantaneous because, you know, the growth rate is very, very high. Okay. Now, of course, if you have a sufficiently good time resolution, then you can pick up kinetics. Uh, 
Does this happen in the case of pure iron? Yes. So, uh, an experiment done by Raymond uh, in um, Urbana Champagne. Okay. Where he took pure iron, uh, a single crystal whisker of pure iron, yeah. extremely rapidly cooled it, and sure enough, one in steady transmission. So, it's a mechanism of transmission. It doesn't require alloying elements. But the alloying elements slow it down, slow down the other transformation, so you don't need to cool extremely rapidly. And of course, the only difference between martensitic transformation in pure iron is the strain, which you can get ferrite by a diffusional transformation, but you won't get any strain. Okay. See you this afternoon. Thanks. You see, I'm keeping your custom by leaving the mystery here. <laughs> <laughs>